I um, so traction. I am Shauna Wolverton, and I am the SVP of product at Zendesk. And probably like many of you, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I get up in the morning with like a fire in my guts to build great products. And as you probably know, there's a lot of obstacles to do that, right? I have uh, a whole bunch of planning meetings. I've got an inbox full of salespeople pleading for new features. Sometimes a CEO causes a replan. It's really fun. Um, I've got press reading. Shout out to my PR partner who's joining me today. It's a busy day. And it's that fire, I think, that, that you overcome to, um, to build great things. And when you think about what customers want, uh, that's easy, right? They're pretty good at telling you what they want, right? Who among us does not have a Jira backlog or a spreadsheet of big ideas that customers want or voice of the customer top 10 and we roll them out in our scheduling and our planning meetings and we maybe pick a few out and then we tell everyone those aren't the things we're going to do because our mission is bigger than that. Like we are not the people who walk the requirements from the customers to the engineers. It's about um, putting ourselves in the shoes of our customers, knowing what they know, thinking what they think, feeling what they feel, the really definition of empathy uh, that, we, that we bring to the table and do our magic alchemy of, of prioritization to build the things that not just customers want, but customers need. And we do this a lot um, by making assumptions. And they're not necessarily bad, right? I mean, I think our brains are hardwired to make assumptions. If we had to come into every situation and knew like, uh, we wouldn't get out of the house. But sometimes we over-index and, and we get this wrong. I think one of the things we tend to do here is assume our users are a lot like us. I know it's a thing I did a lot. Uh, I had a fun experience with an executive. We were building a mobile product. And you know, this is a man who has three people who run his life and someone who drives him back and forth to work. And he's like, I don't like that pesky little number. Uh, on the notifications on my apps. We shouldn't have those in our product, right? We are not the people we're building for. One of my early jobs was to build, and this is, I'm gonna date myself here, right? Late 90s, and I was building this super cool portal where cool custom part manufacturers could enter all of their capabilities and big uh, companies could force, find them and send them RFPs. I was like, it's so great, and they can point and click. And I was not getting a lot of traction. And so I did a little tour, and I met up with a plastic injection molder, and I went into the office, no computers. One, like somewhere back in the plant, three fax machines, right? And so I was just entirely wrong um, about what these customers want. And it's not rocket science, right? We, we go out and we test these things, but sometimes we really do um, jump to the wrong conclusions. And I think um, one of the things here that's really interesting to me is like we live in a sea of data about what our customers are doing, um, when they're doing it, where they're doing it. And you know, thank God for Pendo. Most of you probably don't know a life before there were metrics. I mean, I, in my early product management days, were burning CDs and designing packages and shipping it out into the world and hoping, right? You were just sort of uh, waiting for someone to call or complain or give feedback. It was really tough. But all of that data, I think, just isn't enough, right? It tells you a lot about the, the what and the where and the how, but not so much about the why. It's like, why are your users getting stuck in a particular page? Why did one of the features you build go through the roof and another one didn't? And I think when you see some of those things, like you've built this great feature for your customers and you get nothing. And it's easy to start kind of resenting them. If anyone spent time in the torture chamber that is a user session, we're testing new functionality, and you can, they're like so close, just click the button, um, right? It's, you're like, ah! But I think the opposite of that feeling, and this is, I don't want to, like it's a little corny, but it's not like, I think we have to find love, like real actual love for our customers and not, you know, the hot and cold teenaging kind, but like the old married couple kind. Like you know that 
they load the dishwasher wrong, and you love them anyway, right? It's um, that kind of deep abiding love. And to love them, you have to know them. And clearly, we cannot go and have a beer with everyone who uses our product, but I think it is important to have people who use your software that you can have a beer with, that you know the names of their children, right? That you have an interaction with them on some kind of social media platform. Because it's really hard to have empathy and to put yourself in someone's shoes without really putting in the time uh, you know, to know the name of their pet hedgehog. Um, but when those faceless data points have names, uh, it's a lot harder to do the wrong thing by them, right? It's harder to end of life a feature when the replacement is, you know, oh, it'll be soon. Uh, it's hard to give them new features without investing in the tools to help your customers get there. So we don't hurt the ones we love. And if we can find love for our customers, I think we can all be better product managers. Um, but it does get tricky, right? Because sometimes our customers and our users and their users, right? It's, um, it's not always clear who the they are, right? The people who help pay the bills are often very much, uh, their needs are at odds with the people who will eventually be using the software, right? No one, no user in the history have ever said, I would love to have a video pop up in the middle of this Colbert clip I'm watching on YouTube. Like, that is not a delightful user experience. But um, for the people who are paying the bills, clearly um, it is. So thinking about the different parts and the sort of different legs of the triangle when it comes to users and customers, you know, um, managers want compliance, users want flexibility. How do you find the balance? End users want to get support from a company. Uh, companies would rather not pick up the phone because it's expensive. How do you build the kinds of features that can make both sides of those equations as happy as possible? And again, like this is not a big truth bomb, right? We, you have to talk. Um, but more, way, way more importantly, you have to listen. Um, early in my career, I had like a nerdy, back-end, tiny piece of functionality that I was the product manager for. Not surprisingly, not a lot of salespeople calling and saying, can you come to our EBC and talk to this customer about the core schema of Salesforce? Not a thing, actually. But it turned out a lot of people hated going to this. The product managers who did kind of have that bigger picture. So I started raising my hand. And I went to 50 of them in one year. And what was amazing to me is that it radically changed the way I looked at building my product. I, we had personas, and I had flows, and I had thought about the users. And it turned out I was just thinking about them entirely wrong. I had this idea of a nice like lone admin who was creating custom fields kind of every day, coming in with some new stuff. Not at all. And what I heard was not actually answers to my questions. What I heard was my customers talking to each other, talking to themselves, and getting the insight um, about how their business really worked and how I could think about what I was building to serve them better. And you know, I talked about love which you know, may or may not be a thing. But the second part of that is sort of letting your customers know they are loved, letting them feel the love. You know, when you're at events, be transparent. Talk to them about the things that you heard that were important to them and what you built as a result. Write blog posts. Get online and be interactive with the customers. Because eventually, uh, you're going to do something dumb. It happens. Uh, a really bad bug will escape. I love this. Defects escape. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, or you'll do a pricing and packaging change, and it'll piss off everybody. Um, our CEO had to do a fun contrition on this one not many years ago. So when you have that trust and that re those relationships with your customers, um, that goodwill can carry you through some of those really terrible missteps. I don't know if any of you were victims of Salesforce. They were down for almost three days uh, a couple months ago. And sure, there were people online complaining, but there was also this horde of people 
who are like thanking the developers for staying up late and helping them out and we know you're doing your best. And it's crazy that like a human could have sympathy for a bajillion dollar company, but it's because the people inside that organization have made those connections and made those people feel like they're part um, of what they're doing. And, you know, sometimes relationships end. Um, and, and it's, you know, and sometimes it is, you know, it's you, it's not me. But um, there are amazing things that you can find with openness and curiosity when you can get those customers who have decided to leave to open up to you about what it was. I mean, oftentimes it is something that's just not in your control, but it does actually give you some insight into changing business conditions, uh, maybe you know, a canary in the coal mine about a particular industry that you're in if you see a number of customers leaving. So whenever you can, you want to reach out to these customers um, and not as some kind of hail mary part of the sales team where you're begging to retain their business, but to really um, understand what it is uh, that happened and what you can do. Like, there's something to learn uh, from every breakup. And I talked way too fast and I'm really early, but um, does then that's the, my lovely presentation. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.